Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Anderson um, with the Artema Group in Jerome, Idaho, which is uh, just outside of Twin Falls, uh, the southern part of the state. Um, I grew up on Seagull Bay Dairy in American Falls, Idaho, and uh, after college, went back there for five years and managed that operation, and then Greg came back and fired me, so I had to look for employment elsewhere. Um, so I, I've been with uh, the Artema Group about 10 years. Uh, we milk, I, I spend most of my time at AA Dairy, which is where all of our Holsteins are, and we milk 14,000 Holsteins on that location. Um, we've got five Jersey dairies um, that total about 12,000 Jersey cows. Uh, we raise all of our replacement heifers in-house. Uh, my younger brother, Brandon, actually uh, runs our, our heifer program for us and takes those calves from day olds um, up to about 600 pounds at one location. Then we have a, a heifer feedlot where we do all of our breeding and embryo transfer at a, at a separate location that houses about 14,000 head. Um, we, we've been using good bulls um, at AA for a lot of years now. and in the last uh, several years have started to do more and more uh, embryo transfer work, um, uh, particularly IVF work on our own donors and, and do a fair amount of uh, embryo transfer work for a couple uh, outside parties as well. Um, I guess uh, I have, I also own Triple Crown Genetics, uh, which is where I use that prefix on the cattle that I own uh, personally. and. I started that when I first went to the Artema Group to try and, I, I enjoyed the genetic side of the business and wanted to uh, continue to do that. And we've kind of incorporated a little more of that into the, the uh, commercial operation as well. Thanks, John. We'll inter entertain some questions uh, throughout as well. So uh, certainly we want it to be uh, interactive, but we'll get through some introductions as well. Uh, Greg, please. Yeah, Greg Anderson uh, with Seagull Bay Dairy and Anderson Dairy. We're also in southern Idaho um, in the Burley areas where our larger herd is, and then uh, Seagull Bay Dairy is in American Falls. So, yeah, my father, Alan, uh, myself, and my older brother, Ben, were the, the partners in the, the two dairy operations. To combined, we milk around 2,200 cows. Um, Couple hundred of them are Holsteins, and the rest are uh, crossbreds, mostly with uh, Montebilliard and Swedish Red breeds. But our breeding program for the Holstein is uh, um, is focused at the Seagull Bay Dairy, although our cattle travel between both facilities for the most part. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's what uh, who who's part of our business. Uh, John, like I say, my older brother. I didn't fire him, but he did find some new opportunities. And with the Seagull Bay prefix, uh, you know, the old man mirror cow, that, that mating happened back when John, and of course my father Alan has a lot to do with that too. And so uh, anyway, excited to be here and, and talk about a little bit about what we see as the, the trends in, in breeding. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Greg. And certainly, you know the uh, the change that you guys have gone through, and uh, it's good that uh, you don't have to have too many domestics up here as well. So, uh, Greg Coyne, New York, and certainly I was talking to Greg earlier, and uh, um, certainly battling the winter uh, elements this year. Greg said it's his fair fit of challenges as well. So he's, he has certainly welcomed the trip to uh, to Phoenix for the next couple of days. So, uh, Greg. Uh, when my grandfather decided to milk cows in western New York, it certainly wasn't in the month of February. <laughs> it's been terrible there. But, uh, today we milk 900 registered Holsteins and, and farm over 2,000 acres. Last year we joined a group of seven other dairies along with DFA to form the nation's first uh, cold milk separation plant. All eight farms are located within 20 miles of this plant so the milk can be um, brought there right consistently. Um, the eight, eight farms collectively milk 13,000 cows and produce over a million pounds per day. So I'm glad to be in Arizona today. <laughs> no, certainly <laughs> we talked about uh, how much snow and impact it has and how hard it is to, to dairy in those conditions as well. So certainly uh, welcome and certainly a pleasure to have you here as well. Um, 
coming from not as cold a climate, but certainly also has its challenges. Uh, Don Bennick, uh, North Florida Dairy. Yes, good afternoon. Um, we're, we're a um, all purebred commercial dairy, and we uh, are definitely uh, uh, working on the direction of producing the cow uh, that we feel is, is the most profitable for us. Uh, uh, and I have to thank the folks uh, uh, to my right uh, for providing uh, uh, some very valuable genetics to us. Uh, uh, these folks uh, are uh, very key in our program. Uh, uh, we've, we have had the opportunity to uh, develop some cow families of our own uh, uh, just through survival of the fittest and uh, uh, seeing the individuals uh, that uh, uh, like to come out on top. Just on that, uh, Don, what's your cow numbers there at the dairy currently, uh, if you would? Uh, we would have, if you count little babies and everything, uh, uh, a, a little over 10,000 head. Uh, uh, there'd be about 9,000 females, uh, uh, 4,800 uh, milking age cows. Yeah, great. I think when you, you know, just even hear these uh, gentlemen talk, uh, even in brief, how things have changed for them. You know, we talk about cooperative uh, milk businesses and uh, outside services and, and the scope and the, and the expansion that they've, they've embraced and that, I think it, it really shows uh, how they've had to change but certainly their leadership as well. And when you talk about you know, a cumulative of just over 30,000 cows sitting at uh, one table, you can certainly uh, see how much experience and knowledge these, uh, these gentlemen um, can offer share and uh, that we can uh, take home to, to our corners of the world as well. So I have a few questions <coughs> for you gentlemen that uh, certainly will probably uh, stimulate some conversation uh, maybe here and even later on uh, this evening as well. So uh, John, I'm gonna start with you. Um, you know, as you talked about your expansion and change and what, where do you see and how have you adjusted to your selection um, for your breeding? You know, we have certainly have different traits now than we did before and, and even adjustments as they go along. Certainly we're trying to create a cow that uh, fits into your situation and marketable um, and as modern as they can be. Where, how do you outline that uh, in three words or less? <laughs> well, uh, is that the mic on? No. Justin? Got it. I guess, uh, you know, at AA in particular, when we started, uh, when I started there 10 years ago, uh, we had put a, put a real emphasis on health traits, <coughs> and longevity uh, in our operation. We have about 10,000 cows in free stalls at that operation, about 4,000 in open lots with shades. Um, majority of those cows are milked three times a day, uh, uh, milked through parallel parlors, and our focus was on on uh, breeding a cow that would would thrive in that environment. Um, so we we did put a focus on on those health traits. DPR is something that you know, you know we talked about you know previously. Uh, Dave talked about it not being real heritable, and my opinion was at that point that I need to make a real focus on it if we're going to make a difference. Um, and so we've we've looked at traits like that, somatic cell. Um, uh, and we've done that for quite some time. We feel like we've made a real difference. Uh, as we've analyzed our records with our cattle, our reproductive performance, uh, we've seen um, a real correlation uh, there between those traits we've selected for and, and what we're seeing as, as far as performance in our herd. Um, here recently, uh, we've started to put a little more emphasis back onto some production and pounds of protein in particular and tried to make some improvements there as we move forward. Um, and we've utilized, we've utilized genomic testing in our herd pretty extensively. Uh, we started, I started using genomic bulls in our herd as soon as they became available. Um, and not at 100% when I first started, but um, through that first year as I gained more and more confidence, it didn't take us long before we got, got close to 100%. And the majority of the Majority of the first, second, third lactation cows in our herd are sired by genomic bulls, um, and we're 
you know, 99 plus percent uh, on genomics right now. So, uh, and it's allowed us, you know, with genomic bulls and, and being able to genomic test females, it has allowed us to, you know, I guess look a little deeper into uh, our selection criteria um, and make some decisions there. But I guess, and we, I'll probably get into this later, but I mean, we have an idea of the type of cow we're trying to breed um, in our operation and, and the type of cow that I feel like is going to uh, help make the Holstein cow continue to make her viable in the future. Uh, I definitely, I'm a Holstein fan. We milk a lot of jerseys as well. I have no intentions to ever change the AA herd from a Holstein herd. And so um, I feel like we have the genetics now um, that are available to us and we can continue to improve on that to make sure that, uh, that the Holstein cow works for us on a large commercial operation long term. Thanks, John. I think, uh, Greg, I think you've seen some, some of those uh, similar adjustments, but, but, but in a little different atmosphere and a little different uh, color, as you indicated early on as well. So, Yeah, you know, if we, uh, if you want to know how things have changed, you know, of course, we, uh, you know, we used a whole lot of Bell and Marshall, Winchester, you know, a lot of these, these uh, bulls, that, uh, they, they produced a heck of a lot of milk. But there were a heck of a lot of dead calves born. And there were uh, some other uh, side effects, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so, yeah, we tried uh, and got into using some other breeds. And, uh, you know, the hybrid vigor sure, uh, sure can manifest itself and things. So, you know, we really, on our breeding plans 15 years ago, um, you know, that was before what you might call the O-Man change and, and how O-Man helped change the breed in the last uh, decade. And so, you know, really our focus now too is fat and protein, combined fat and protein, and, and um, adequate fitness. I guess that's the way I would describe it. Fat and protein first, adequate fitness, meaning mostly stay away from the steep negatives on DPR. Uh, you know, calving is one you got to watch, especially if you want to sell bulls to AI. We all know how uh, picky everybody is on calving ease. So, you know, you got to watch that pretty close. Um, and so that's kind of where we like to look at it. You know, the, as an industry as a whole, we've gotten better at raising calves. You know, so people seem to have more replacements. You know, whatever role sex semen plays in that, I don't know. But part of it is we're better at keeping calves alive. You know, with high beef prices right now, it may be different from when they're low. But there's a whole lot of voluntary culling. That's why high production, I think, will, will never go out of style. And so that's if you're ranking our selection traits, combined fat and protein is number one. And then, of course, you want, you know, adequate fertility and calving ability and, and the, the uh, utter health traits as well. Uh, you know, when you talk about linears in our selection criteria, that's something 10, 15 years ago, we watched that really close, brought the guys out to mate the cows and match the linears up. It basically plays uh, almost zero role. Now for us, other than we watch stature, meaning that I want to keep it low, and, you know, there's some matings you need to watch teat length on, uh, things like that that, seem, that make a difference in the parlor. And so uh, that's how things have changed for us over the years. And I really, th I really am a big fan of the modern Holstein. Uh, we have a pretty big debate within our family about, you know, how to breed the, breed the herd, but uh, I'm a big fan of the modern Holstein and the, the advancements we're making on, uh, on the fitness traits to complement the gains we're making in, in the production areas. So by and large, that kind of uh, encompasses our philosophy. I think uh, certainly lots of valuable there. And uh, when you talk about uh, getting more live calves and volatility, it's, it's uh, certainly a key indicator as well. Uh, uh, Greg, take us to New York. Um, over the years, we've always used the top TPI bulls. And while we, we still feel the type is important, is the milk check is, is what's vital to our business. So we, we use a lot of the uh, high fat and protein bulls. 
the whole, as the Holstein Association has made changes to their TPI formula, we've made changes uh, to go along with them. Uh, one other change is in the future, we certainly got to be looking more into breeding for these polled bulls. I think the world's going to dictate it to us in, in the near future. That's great. I think that's uh, always interesting to see that there's, you know, pulled wasn't something that was uh, on the forefront, and you know how uh, how it can be embraced and uh, and how it how it can have an impact uh, with with your situation as well, uh, Don. And if you have a couple slides or anything at any time you'd like to present yeah. to us, uh, sure. certainly feel free. Um, you know, we'll get uh, get it up and running for you there as well. So. If, uh, if you guys know or haven't uh, seen Don before, he's, uh, he is quite colorful and he does have a little bit of interaction here with some, some presentation. Not taking away anything that the other guys aren't technically advanced because I certainly know that they are, but uh, Don's got a, uh, a couple little slides that he feels can better uh, bring us to bring a picture to uh, uh, how he outlines uh, the modern day cow at uh, North Florida Dairy. Yeah, to start out, uh, this is just uh, kind of the front uh, of the slides to PowerPoint to give. Uh, this is an old uh, uh, Rudolph uh, that made 350,000 pounds uh, uh, out in our free stalls. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, the, the seven tanker loads of milk. Uh, here, uh, uh, Rudolph was a bull that was very important in, in adding longevity to our herd. Uh, and uh, uh, she had, actually, this cow is still alive uh, on another farm. Some of these great old cows we don't load on the beef truck. We throw them out in a uh, nice grass pasture for them to uh, live their time out, but had a friend that was looking uh, uh, for uh, some special cows to flush, and uh, he took uh, two or three of those and is giving them a the kind of home we want them to have. Uh, one of the things, uh, when uh, I started out uh, as a youngster, the first thing uh, in learning, and this was in 4-H at eight and nine years old, uh, was the first uh, thing in learning and judging, evaluating, buying, uh, whatever we did with cows, uh, the way we were taught, uh, is uh, first we learned the parts of the cow, and uh, once we learned the parts of the cow, uh, then we learned what each one of those parts should look like. Now, uh, uh, at the time uh, I learned this at seven or eight years old, the equivalent of my father and grandfather had been taught the same way. It's the way we teach our kids today. They, uh, in fact, in, in Horge Derman a year ago, seven feature issues in a row were teaching us how to evaluate cows this way. This is the way we pick them. This is choose them. Uh, we do it this way. Uh, we, we call it tight. We also, in that era, we were told if we had uh, and were instructed, uh, that uh, if we had type and we had production, uh, we, we had the perfect cow. And we obviously made fantastic uh, uh, progress. The blue line is, is the genetics of, of the, the cow herd. The red line is the production, the milk genetics uh, of um, uh, the bulls in our population, the AI bulls. And through the use of AI bulls, we made uh, uh, great uh, uh, progress in production. Uh, and as we said, we also made uh, this same great progress uh, uh, in type. Uh, the red line is type, the green is uh, udder, uh, the blue is feet and legs. So with all this progress, we accomplished everything uh, we went out to do, uh, but what happened? Our herd life went down. Our cow mortality rates have gone up uh, across the country. 
Uh, our somatic cells were increasing. Again, the, the blue line is the cows, the red line is the bulls, and as uh, uh, over time we were raising the somatic cells of our cows at a very significant level, and uh, uh, the, uh, but when it came uh, time that finally our processing centers and our milk samples uh, started uh, keeping track of the somatic cells for us, uh, we, figured, we found that there was a way that we could reduce the somatic cells in our herds genetically. So as you can see, the AI studs started putting lower somatic cell uh, bulls into our AI population, and in doing so, they brought uh, our somatic cells of our dairy herd down. Data in both the US and Europe shows the difference between the very highest somatic cell bulls and the very lowest somatic cell bulls is one half the mastitis. Brian, some of your recent data <coughs> is tripling that, right? That there's three times as much mastitis in the high somatic cell cows versus the low somatic cells. So uh, through uh, measuring this and so forth, uh, we made some dramatic progress. Uh, you've seen this slide in various forms today. Uh, this is showing how our bulls, the, 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 the blue is Holstein, the yellow is Jersey, through the years, how the use of low or of low fertility bulls, the bulls being on top, this being exactly the opposite of production, how these low fertility bulls uh, brought the fertility of our cow population down. When, uh, when I first started milking cows and AI was essentially in its infancy, farmers up and down the road all over had a 60% conception. Today, people brag if they have a 30% conception. Luckily, we're finally working on turning this around. We're, we bottomed out and just starting to now start back and, and bring the fertility back into our cow population. Uh, and this is some of the data some of the folks here have, uh, expressed uh, is demonstrated very well is in 1996 uh, this is the number uh, the percent of dairy calves born alive in the US in 1996 93.4% uh, 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 were, were born alive in other words we had a 6% a stillborn rate by, in six years, by 2002, that had jumped, so we hit 11% of the calves that were being born in the U.S. dairy herd were being born dead. And by 2007, 14% of the dairy calves being born in the U.S. were being born dead. This was largely, as these gentlemen talked about, and some of the earlier folks, the result of one bull. He was the number one TPI bull in the country. And he ended up with six or seven sons that followed him uh, that uh, were that way. That particular bull, 21% of the calves from his first calf efforts were born dead. Uh, so you, you can see here that uh, uh, in the process of, of uh, we, we of course made these dramatic uh, improvements in type in the process of uh, bringing the, uh, the, the increase in production that we saw, the, and this was largely measured in our two-year-old production, that the two-year-olds that gave the most milk were the ones that really got uh, uh, got the favoritism in bull selection, well, the two-year-olds that gave the most milk were the ones that didn't breed back. Cows that breed back by nature, and when they're five months pregnant, start dropping in milk. So in breeding for all this, this uh, high production and the way we're doing it, 
we were killing the fertility in our, in our dairy population and, and at the same time dropping down uh, the, the average life in the herd. This is a slide uh, that I plagiarized, uh, uh, and this is, uh, many of us in this room would call him uh, the greatest or as great a cowman as we ever knew, and that was Pete Blodgett. The, these, this slide is 20 to 25 years old, and he was saying at that time and preaching to all of us that what we needed was more, in our large herds, was more pregnant cows and heifers, cows and heifers that had live calves, less stillbirths, uh, cows that maintain their body weight uh, in early lactation while producing at a profitable level, fewer dead cows, cows uh, in a popular term of his, cows with more vigor with fire in their belly, healthy udders, low somatic cells, mobile cows and trouble-free cows. He was 25 and 30 years ahead of us in what he was telling us, and we just uh, waited uh, too long. Now, there's no, we today have the tools we, to make the changes we need. We don't need to go to this 125-year-old technology that we start talking about that is still taught, that we still have our competitions in, that people still believe in. We now have the ways to correct these problems we saw. We can measure for productive life. Every bull you use has all this data. You have the ability to find out on your own uh, bulls and females uh, uh, the data on productive life, on somatic cells, on, on uh, fertility, DPR, and of course heifer and cow conception rate, calving ease, uh, both sire and daughter, and stillbirths, both sire and daughter. So uh, we're at a time where we don't need to go through this anymore. Now, we've got a room full here, uh, and, I, and I can look and see in all of you a bunch of Monday, Monday morning quarterbacks. And, and I know you're, you're a Bills fan, and I know you two guys probably have not yet uh, uh, give, forgiven your Seahawks coach for that uh, last <laughs> pass play. And, and Dan, I, you probably are still uh, saying how your coach should never have been overwhelmed, or Wisconsin should not ever have been overwhelmed by Ohio State. And each one of you are, are, are Monday morning quarterbacks here. I want you to pick me out. Now I'm going to make each one of you a coach, and I want <laughs> each one of you to to pick me out your football team. And uh, are you, uh, you you pick pick out your quarterback and your your lineback and your running backs and and so forth for me? And uh, now is it uh, do, do you want to know anything about them, or are you going to if you, now that you're the big coach, can you just do it by looking at them? You know, would it kind of maybe be help to no, this guy can't stay out of jail, and this guy uh, uh, doesn't show up to practice, and this guy has a bad knee that it takes him 20 seconds to run the 40, and, and uh, would you like to maybe this potential quarterback uh, maybe like to know his uh, completion percentage and whether he has any rushing talents? Uh, would you kind of like your, your linebacker uh, to... Uh, uh, maybe know how many sacks he's made and how many tackles he averages a game. Well, here you are, you're coaches, and you want all those data if you're gonna put together a team, but you make your living milking cows. Don't you want that data on your cows or are you just gonna keep looking at them and think you can evaluate uh, how profitable and how long they're gonna stay around? Thanks, Don, I, I think that's uh, such a valuable. <laughs> A valuable lesson and, and how it how it is you know a real-life example if you will and and the certainly learned about the power of data this morning and uh, how much more that uh, you know we can we can accommodate and, uh, and and utilize to continue that process as you guys you know all discussed uh, all kinds of things I think every each and every one of you certainly you know 
bring health traits to the forefront uh, production. Uh, none of you forget about the, you know, the true investment and how it's going to affect your bottom line. And you all have uh, certainly, you know, innovation with genomics and, and brought that to a, as a tool and, and how you guys can use it. And certainly a few of you has touched on, on the genomic usage versus proven sires and, and all that within your, within your herd to build the model that, that is uh, important to you guys. Um, and certainly some traits are, are more important and affect more more of your bottom line directly um, at the balance sheet at the end of each month. Where do you guys see some of your top traits? And I'm going to start with Mr. Coyne coming backwards this time. And, and a couple of the new ones and, and nothing that got brought up on the way through. And I'm going to ask, what's your feeling on outcross and too much inbreeding and that a little bit as you're in your discussion as well, Greg? Uh, the top traits that you feel have really made your bottom line? And a couple of the new traits that are coming in, you know, the fertility index, feed efficiency, and uh, just touch on your outcross or inbreeding as well, if you don't mind. Um, I, think, I think we started breeding for productive life as probably as soon as anybody um, in productive life. All those numbers are quite important to us, the uh, DPR numbers. Are, those numbers are all very real. They're, they're not just numbers that they pull out of a hat in, in Baltimore. Um, so I guess that's my reaction is that the DPR and productive life are very real numbers that we need to pay attention to. And, and they are real numbers and it certainly is, is, as we indicated from our, we'll learn more about it tomorrow, the depth of the research um, and real life examples that, you know, certainly you can experience when you have the number of cows that you do and, and how the, the top end and the, and the bottom end can perform on that. Um, you talked about polled earlier, and, and I'm going to ask you just just enlighten us a little bit on why you feel inside that you know heading that direction, feeling that uh, that insight. Um, certainly, what, what, what gives you that inclination, uh, Greg? Well, I think it's, it's the way of the world. Uh, in Europe, they're quite a, they're light years ahead of us as far as using the polled bulls. And, um, it's just a matter of time until. I don't know if it's going to be required by law, but it's going to be demanded by the public in, in sometime in the future. Uh, I think it's great. I know certainly, and it's uh, we see it and we hear it, and, and certainly at the embrace change quicker than on some fronts than others, um, as, as you can can certainly do that. Um, wh why wouldn't you, Greg? What's your feeling about some of the outcross inbreeding? I certainly you guys have had a little bit more on that than some of the other ones. Um, and embraced it, and it's certainly, you know, seen the profitability on it as well. Well, yeah, I may have a couple comments there then. Um, certainly inbreeding's an issue. I mean, when genomics first came out, there was hope that we'd find some outlier sire stacks or something that uh, we could all use and things, but, you know, it's kind of been getting narrower and narrower. I wrote down all the bulls I've used in the last year, all the current heifers I'm flushing, and and try to find something without mogul and robust uh, right there in the forefront of the pedigree. Just try it. I mean, there's a few. So, yeah, we've got a problem with that. And obviously, the obvious answer is for us, you know, in my main herd where we crossbreed, that's not an issue. But when you're breeding top end genetics in, in the purebred business, it is an issue. And so we do need to continue to identify um, outcross genetics within the U.S. And uh, certainly there may be some uh, good merging and, and matings that could happen with some of the uh, European Holstein lines and things like that. Uh, I think that's certainly a, a, a good option. Um, you know, when you talk about health traits, you know, we we like the health traits. You just, I keep, I try to keep it in, uh, in perspective. You know, obviously where there's a negative correlation between some of the really high production bulls and, and you know, it's hard to get a 70 pound protein bull with three on DPR. I mean, there's a few getting close, but that's, uh, that's a lot to ask of a bull to give us that much production and, and that high of a fertility score. So, you know, for us, we are leaning a little heavier to production, but sometimes there's a lot of these complementary matings you can make. 
Um, you know, the high health trait bull on a really extreme production female, of course, makes a lot of sense. You know, here's the thing I'll say about the pulled. Um, pulled is, is so much in its infancy right now. Um, it's got a bright future, I think, but uh, semen cells is what drives the demand for, for these new traits. And until those start to gain some steam, uh, you know, the pole will still, still kind of lag behind. As far as the public is concerned, I mean, there's, I think it's still a really, hopefully it's decades away and I'm dead before, you know, it's required that we can't dehorn animals, you know, as, as if that's some cruel way to, to uh, farm. You know, I'm kind of one of these guys that, uh, is really averse to thinking that the public, the public wants good quality food at an affordable price. That's what they want. There's very loud voices that say otherwise, that they wanna control everything we do. And I'm not, uh, I'm not so sure that we should, should believe all of that. Uh, in my opinion, it's number one is produce quality product and they want it at affordable price. And then, uh, you know, some of these other traits, you know, and I own a lot of pole genetics, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to be part of that, but it's, I think it's uh, in its infancy is the way to put it, I guess. Yeah, certainly, and, and I think it's, it's interesting to, you know, see where you bring it in and, and as much as you say it's an infancy, you, you don't overlook it as well and, and uh, don't want to, you know, see it go by the wayside and, and, and certainly there's, there's change that will come, you know, and what, what time and what pace, you know, uh, the media can have certainly impacts on, on our food production and our quality and it's, it's probably a lot of us in the room that need to embrace bringing less negativity to those opportunities and bring in more positive when we have the opportunity and and certainly those those other ones can certainly cause this issue and and be viral at times and i think it's 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 us in the room and our peers that we can get that message uh and be on the positive side and not always let the negative uh take over so much so it's certainly really good comments and uh and how we can keep that quality and it, as I said, it, it's the producers that, uh, it's our um, bottom line that, uh, or the food quality that is important to us. Uh, John, some of your comments regarding a little bit of inbreeding and outcross as well, and some of the new indexes and, and your top traits as well. Okay. <clears throat> regarding inbreeding, I guess uh, we're conscious of it. Um, I don't let it dictate my breeding program. Uh, obviously, when we're out breeding cows, uh, we've got enough of them to get through that we're not making individual mating decisions on the majority of those cows. Um, obviously, if you look at the bulls that are in the tank, uh, there's a lot of similarities. They've got different pedigrees, but they all have a lot of the same traits that I want. And so, um, you know, we'll, we've got those different bulls in the tank, and the breeder goes out, and he uses a bull in a pen for the most part. Um, and then he goes to the next pen, and he'll use a different bull. Um, you know, as I do individual matings on some of our donor animals, um, obviously I use some different tools that are available. Um, you know, Dr. Lawler had, uh, you know, Holstein, the Holstein site has, a, has an inbreeding uh, calculator uh, that they've updated now to where you can actually look at genomic inbreeding. I actually usually punch all of my matings into that, at least to uh, take a look at it and see where we're at on the inbreeding on it. But, uh, yeah, you know, we, as I look at my spreadsheets of all of our animals, um, and we've been breeding the same way on our herd for a lot of years, um, kind of a bull of the day type of a breeding uh, program. But, you know, as I look at the inbreeding, you know, obviously you've got some outliers and some, some individual animals that have some pretty high inbreeding, but for the most part, um, there's not anything that concerns me too much, um, obviously with some of these bulls like Mogul and Robust that Greg mentioned, they're, gonna, they're going to be very prevalent in a lot of pedigrees, but there's also a reason for that because uh, they're bringing a lot of the traits that we're looking for. Um, as far as uh, 
some of the traits that I look for. There's not one, there's no one trait that'll keep a bull off my list. I don't have a magic formula, I punch it in, and if a bull doesn't have every single one of them, he's not gonna be on my list. Um, but, uh, you know, I spoke about a lot of those things we look at and have for quite some time, uh, particularly the health traits, and, and now more on production as well. Um, but somatic cells, something I watch very closely. Uh, I feel like it has as much to do with <coughs> with longevity of our cows as anything. Um, continue to look at, at the fertility um, traits, DPR, um, and calving ease. As I'm making choices on animals to purchase or animals to use as donors, I like to look at sire calving ease on those females as well. Um, and as, especially if you're trying to sell, if you're trying to sell bulls to AI, you've gotta be pretty aware of that. Um, Feed efficiency is something we'll, we'll start to look at more now that that's available. Obviously, nothing plays, I don't think, not anything like production that'll affect that. Um, if you notice, a lot of the feed, high feed efficient numbers also are high on production. Um, and pole genetics, uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely using, have some pole donors, uh, use some pole bulls. I think, um, I agree with Greg, Obviously, I, I also don't feel like we have to let the public dictate what we're going to do, but we also have to, um, we may have to make some adjustments down the road. And, and we're very protocol driven on our operation. And so when I tell the guys, when the guys at the calf branch have a protocol that when the calves come down, they're a day old, we, we shave the pole and we put paste on it. They don't, make, they don't generally distinguish whether that calf is already pulled or not. Um, and so some pulled calves are gonna get paste on them. So, you know, with genomics, we're gonna make some incredible progress with the, with the pole genetics over the next several years, and we're probably not that far from having, having a homozygous bull that's not that far behind the top horn bull. And once we do have that, I think you're gonna see, see it pick up some momentum when dairies can actually make a decision that we're going all polled, we're gonna use homozygous pole bulls, and we're not gonna dehorn or paste, we're gonna take that out of our protocol and you'll start to see that kind of take off and you know with the with the genetic progress that we're making probably not you know we may be closer to that than we think i don't know yeah certainly you're you're willing and, and able to open keep the doors open but uh, certainly genetic gain is still still in your forefront to yeah. you know, to, to drives drives your dairy when you have that number of cows so it uh, um it's, al it's always there, and certainly the genetic progress is not going to be, you know, uh, given up to, to acquire that. Um, Don, uh, back to you for a, f a little more information, if you will, and, and your thoughts and input on a little bit on the poll side as well. As, uh, and if you have a couple other slides you'd like to flip through, feel free at this time. I've got your, your football team ready to go there. I think you've selected them, and uh, just, they're just waiting for their coach to give them the call. Is he going <laughs> to... Is he going to pass or is he going to throw? You, you, you the volunteer? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, our, our feeling uh, uh, on poll is uh, we've got some of the uh, peoples uh, whose breeding we really respect and so forth that are in the process of developing poll bulls like the coins and, and the Steiners at Pine Tree and that kind of thing. Uh, we're probably... Uh, there's, there's no way we can improve on, on what they do. And once, uh, uh, once they have it developed into uh, high production, high health trade individuals, uh, we'll be buying semen and using that. But in the meantime, uh, we're, we're probably sticking uh, very heavily to our program of essentially exclusively breeding for protein and health traits, period. And, and absolutely, and I think it's, you know, it's certainly you've, you adapted those, those uh, traits, if you will, early on, and it certainly has taken you down the road that is, is giving you as, as much profitability as you could build in as quick as anybody, Don. I'm, that's certainly a large number of cows, and, and you know when you look at your pedigrees that are showing up and how they've, uh, how they've came to the forefront as well, it, uh, uh, the health traits and the new health traits have certainly been been activated and, and you've stayed on that path, if you will. So, and keeping down inbreeding has, has been very uh, 
uh, important uh, to us. Uh, luckily, it seems like uh, it, you know the right bulls have come along. You know, you know uh, Mogul and Massey and uh, uh, various uh, uh, other bulls that have uh, added a real contribution. Uh, but what we do uh, at, at at each of the three summaries is uh, is pick out about 16 bulls that will be used on the whole cow herd. Those 16 bulls will will start doing things like line up all the mogul sons, line up all the super sire sons, and and all the uh, uh, the other bulls that are relatively related pick out the top uh, protein and health trait bulls in each one of those and uh, and then assemble this uh, group of 16 and then they are uh, they are computer mated for the lowest inbreeding percentage on the whole cow herd although we will put a cap of of say maybe a limit of 350 uh, is all we will use of this bull or uh, matings or something like that to, to uh, uh, get those 16 uh, through now. But when we, but the, uh, all of the flush matings are handmated. I, I do that uh, uh, personally. Uh, and what we're trying particularly with the IVFs is uh, to develop uh, the extremes and uh, use, uh, uh, and, and we have developed a, a fair number of high health rate females and try to use uh, some real extreme production bulls that are not too far out of whack on health traits uh, on them uh, and say hope to get uh, 20 progeny and hope that one of those 20 will have the health traits uh, and the production and that one individual grab that one and that's the next one we IVF and, and use that kind of a process to try to make uh, larger steps ahead. And, and speaking of your IVF program, you know, what, what do you feel what's your percentage or how many pregnancies are you making annually on, on that, uh, Don? What's your, how aggressive are you with that or what's, how does that play into your overall picture? We're transferring about uh, 60 to 90 IVF embryos a week, so uh, uh, we would be uh, uh, dealing with maybe 4,000. And two years IVFs. ago, 24 months ago, what what was that number at? What was and that? two years ago, what was that number at? Uh, not a lot less than that. But okay, you've been at that level for it's that period of time. Pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Super. Yep. Excellent. As, as we talked this morning, you know, about uh, the GTPI and the ranking and how it, you know, plays such a strong, a strong part of the overall picture and how a lot of sires get selected and certainly you guys use a lot of other tools, if you will, or other traits. What, as, as the industry and, and looking at that GTPI and how it affects such a, a dominant force, um, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Coyne. Where do you feel that the adjustments or suggestions, are you comfortable on the progress that's been made through those that particular formula, and um, how do you feel that uh, you would make some adjustments if, if that would be an opportunity? Uh, certainly, GenX's report card uh, on the Holstein's TPI formula doesn't give them a very good grade, but... Uh, <laughs> Be on the low end, low end of, of passing, but uh, um, tell you the truth, I, I was coming back tomorrow to listen to Tom Lawler tell, tell tell about these changes in the TPI formula. Well, he's going to change the slides tonight, actually, after he listens to you four guys, actually. So he hasn't actually prepared his presentation. But no, I th it's always interesting to see. You know, it has. You know, certainly your first comment. You know, it's it's it's. You can see your reaction on, on how that is, but uh, Greg, where do you feel that is? Or Well, uh, certainly the stature is getting kind of out of control, and I, I don't think we need to add any more stature to the Holstein cow, not, um, not with the data that we have today on them. 
Yep, great. Uh, Greg Anderson, uh, where's your where's your feelings on that? And certainly, you know, uh, with your, your impact, you certainly have had a lot of success with that as well, and 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 how it can be a you know a strong tool as well. Well, right. Uh, you know, sometimes I you know I I struggle with with TPI, and I say, man, are we if we got the right formula as an industry, and I but then I think about some of the bulls that are you know, been on the top of the TPI list and how darn good bulls they are. I mean, Freddie has been at the top. Oh man, of course, Planet, Shottle, those kind of bulls, those, those are darn good bulls. And, uh, you know, so sometimes I say, is there too much emphasis and reward for PTAT in the TPI formula? And I think maybe there is because of the high correlation with PTAT and stature. The fact that utter composite is too highly correlated with stature, and these are some things I've learned from listening from Mr. Bannock. So we may just turn it over to him, and I just say I agree with him. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the same thing with body condition. These two-year-olds that carry some body condition do not score well. Okay. Well, we also know that body condition and and hoof health are somewhat correlated because you've got to have enough adipose tissue in the hoof. This is also things I've learned from Don Bennett, so don't credit me for any of this. You've got to, there, 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 that's my struggle with TPI and for the Holstein board and the membership and the professionals at Holstein, I don't, uh, I'm not knocking the formula down too bad because it's identified some darn good bulls and it, we've made some pretty darn good progress. Um, as far as the way the data is collected for the type, you know, I think there's some reform that needs to happen that way. Um, because really for these health traits and production to continue to, to advance, a lot of the type traits that we reward are negatively correlated with, with the other traits that we want. So, what are we going to do about it? And so, uh, to me, that's more maybe the the reforms that need to happen. And you know, the TPI formula can continue to evolve the, so that the U.S. dairy or, on Holstein breed can can be the global leader. Um, and so that's kind of where my I have mixed uh, mixed feelings about it. You know, I'm probably more of a net merit. Uh, breeder, but we've had a lot of high TPI sires, and like I say, I think Freddie and, you know, looked at Freddie's numbers in, in Canada and his profitability, you know, I think that's, that speaks a lot to that kind of bull, and he's been a staple on the TPI top 10 for a long time. And so, anyway, I've said, said quite a bit there and don't know if I came to a conclusion, but the I think the type data and how much weight you put into an index for type needs to be looked at very uh, honestly because it's like Don showing that picture of how do we evaluate the cow and, and the, you know, the scorecard. Is it really correlated to profitability? So that's... Uh, that's where we, we need to take a good look at that, I think. Hey, I, th I think that's great, you know, to, to bring their, your uh, honest and candid uh, opinions to the forefront is certainly what uh, so much of us can use and utilize. And uh, um, Tom, he showed up right at the right time, didn't you? You're feeling like uh, it was uh, arrow point in time. But uh, no, it's, it's certainly, it's, it's for constructive, as, as you certainly well know. Everybody in this room, it's for, it's for criticism of construction to move forward, and that's certainly what this, these kind of forums are and, and the ones that uh, have happened before us to get us to this direction. So um, I'm sure that uh, if one Anderson would have some strong opinions, I, I can only think that uh, John will as well, and, uh, and certainly welcome that voice as well. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add a few things to what Greg said. I think he and I think a lot alike on this topic. Um, obviously, I feel like we've made great strides with the TPI formula over the years, um, and it has identified some great bulls. Um, 
obviously, I guess, I feel like the changes that we could still make towards it, um, I think, need to help benefit those who actually are, are really using the TPI form to make decisions. Um, I guess, uh, I think there's, and I've had the opportunity to serve on the, the Genetic Advancement Committee with Holstein the last couple of years, and there's obviously varying opinions, which I think is healthy to have different opinions. Um, I, I feel like over the years, um, you know, I, I breed some show cows. I enjoy the show. I, nobody likes going to Madison and, and watching the show more than I do. Uh, I have an appreciation for, for looking at those cows. Um, and I, you know, I've got some cows that I breed for show type and use bulls that I would never use in my commercial herd uh, to do that. And I've never once looked at the TPI for me to make those mating decisions, um, ever. And I feel like we have a lot of people that are giving their input on the TPI formula that, that aren't using the TPI formula to breed their cows either. Um, so at the risk of not being political at all, <laughs> um, stature is a huge problem. Uh, and we've got to find a way to get on top of it. If, if there's one thing I can pick out and say we've got to change it, and I don't know, it's not an easy change. I, I realize that. I, I couldn't, if you just turned it over to me to solve it, I wouldn't have it solved anytime soon because uh, we have a classification system um, that, whether we like it or not, is still based a lot around stature. Um, we classify four times a year through our herd. We have about 1,000 registered cows in the AA herd. We continue to register about 1,000 heifers every year. And so four times a year, I go out for four days straight and follow the classifier around and look at cows with him. And you can take the exact same cow that's 57 inches tall, and she's 81 points, and the cow standing next to her that's the exact same cow but 61 inches tall as a two-year-old, she's 86. And 100 times a day, I have to listen to, there's not enough cow, not, not enough frame, not big enough. Or, you know, and we're not trying to breed jerseys. Well, in my operation, um, I'm, I have no plans of us building a new dairy to accommodate our cows. And so we have to breed cows that fit in our barn, that fit in the free stalls, and really long, really tall cows don't last. I don't have a place for them. And so, um, you know, I, I miss talking about that on traits that I look for, but that's one line item on my spreadsheet when I'm looking at bulls of stature, um, because uh, it, it's something I have to select individually for, and I think it indirectly affects TPI too much through, through PTAT. Um, you know, Greg mentioned it, but um, we've got to figure out a way to, to change that. You know, people have talked about, oh, well, we need a classification system for commercial cows and for registered cows. I, we just need one system. Let's just get it right and let's make it, let's, let's get it right for the people that use it. And I think it's great that there's no right or wrong way of how you breed cows. Um, you can do it. There's plenty of bulls. I can go out and find any bull I want if I'm trying to breed a certain type of cow. And I breed both kinds. I enjoy breeding a show cow, too. It's fun. Uh, my kids like to go out and show, and I like to show. Um, but I think we need to make, we have to remember who our, our customers, the semen's getting sold to these guys that milk cows. And we've got to make sure that we we develop a formula that, that helps cater to them, and, and also on the world market. I mean, we're looked to as a leader in, in genetics, and we've got to continue to improve. So that's just a couple of, of, couple of the, the things I guess I would touch on on that. And, and, they're, and they're important, John. I, don't, I think it's better to, to not keep that in. I think it's, uh, they're, they're, they're real life examples, and, it, and it's great that you can enjoy and experience both both sides of that. I think it takes uh, a number of different players to make the country attractive and each have their own their own drivers, if you will, and uh, and a few people like yourself that can, you know, um, steer both cars is, is, is pretty unique and I think that's uh, uh, very important to, to voice that and, and how it can affect um, the whole package and uh, the industry and, and, and North American genetics and, and keeping it in the forefront and Certainly, spent lots of change, and over those periods of time, and you know, I think if we look at uh, you know Dan Scow that won the first Waterloo show, I think we've we've made some improvements, and uh, we're only going to continue to make them.
but we also need to be the direction and be challenged as well. So it's, it's certainly welcome. Um, Don, which I'm going to give you a, a moment on stature in your opinion, and uh, you know how do you feel about that and, and that that particular um, avenue with that, and maybe you can even enlighten us with with some that modern cow, if you will, and how that uh, affects you. Yeah, almost uh, every commercial dairyman uh, uh, feels we have uh, uh, too much stature. There are there are a, a few exceptions. Uh, and part of it is, uh, it, you know, we, we've got a, a correlation of 0.57 between uh, stature and udder composite. That means if you breed 100% for udder composite, you're going to increase stature at a rate uh, of more than half what you would if you bred for stature alone that you, uh, you look at the short stature bulls, the bulls that are negative in stature, there's almost none with a significant uh, uh, positive for udder composite. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, for that reason, we are convinced and uh, uh, that really you will get better udders breeding straight for productive life uh, than you will uh, breeding for udder composite. It seems crazy, but it, we think it's real. And we think uh, you'll get way better um, foot health than you will for breeding for foot and leg composite. Well, certainly there's a lot of, uh, you know, similarities amongst them to get those, those correlations and, and they are important and you can certainly, understanding them is, is more as much the key of, of getting to where the direction you want to get to as well and, and uh, it, is a, it is key drivers, if you will, to understand them and how, how they can make that improvement, um, whether it's and how fast you want to get there. And the second biggest fault of what we're doing is breeding for sharpness. What, what does sharpness uh, uh, contribute to? In theory, people tell you sharper cows uh, give more milk. Well, that's what I pay my darn DHIA tester for. Uh, that, uh, uh, as uh, Greg mentioned, uh, uh, sharper cows have poor foot health. Uh, they have a lot more anestrus. If you have and can pull you a graph uh, up uh, out of Dairy Science Journal, if you have a herd of cows with between a, a 325 and a 35 uh, body score, and you're catching 80 to 85 percent of those in heat, your cows with the show cow formula of a two two and a quarter to a two five body score, only 25 to 30 of those percent of those will come in heat. Yep. If anybody wants to see it, we can pull that up. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is real life. And I think that's, uh, you know, the sharpness as aspect or, you know, that uh, is body condition score and however you want to relate that has, has that effect, um, um, certainly. You know, with the, it's uh, interesting, these guys started out so politically correct and we're certainly, uh, um, open as the day day went on to bring out uh, some really valid points. And I'd like to open it up to the floor at this time to uh, um, bring some questions to these 30,000 cows, if you will. I think there's a lot of information here that uh, is certainly tucked away, and uh, um, I would certainly like to entertain a few questions um, from uh, from the floor at this time, if uh, if we could, please. It's always. Uh, the shyness, if we, Jeff Butler, you got your hand up. Did you want to say something kind or? You can use the microphone if you'd like as well.
Yeah, I, I think I think we'd all agree here when we're ta we're talking about you know we're not talking about bigger cows. We're all I think we would all agree that I like width to a cow. It's just that it's the height that that I struggle with. Um, you know, Dr. Lawler would probably tell us that I know that I've seen a slide that he had that that stature is one of those one of the treat traits that continues to increase at an increasing rate. Um, and so it may be a lot to ask that we go negative on stature, but what, in my opinion, we have to slow it down somehow. Um, because if, I think if you were to ask most commercial dairymen right now, what's the one thing that, that bothers them about the Holstein breed? And it's why you have some people that are changing to crossbreeds. Or in Idaho right now, there's a lot of guys that were milking. There's a guy that was milking 60,000 Holsteins five, six years ago, and now he's milking 40,000 jerseys. What can we do? And I know this isn't a Holstein convention, but I, partic I personally like the Holstein cow. Um, what can we do to make sure that that Holstein cow stays viable in a commercial setting long term? And, and my experience with a commercial dairy would tell me that we have to, at the very least, slow down the increase on stature because it just, for us, it causes problems. I, we can have, I mean, we have lots of just medium-sized, wide, balanced cows, and they just, they thrive in our environment. They last, they carry a little bit more condition throughout their lactation, um, and to me, they're efficient cows, and that's, that's, that's the kind of cow I'm trying to breed in my operation. I realize that doesn't, that's not the kind of cow that everyone's trying to breed, and I understand that too. Um, but for me, and I feel like a lot of the people that I want to provide bulls that are going to sell semen to, that's the type of cow they want. Roger, yep, I say ahead. something on that too. I, there's, there, are, there are ways, because it's been done, like say in uh, the Nordic countries, they've increased the amount of production and the fertility of the cow without increasing the stature. And so I, it can be done, but it's, uh, you know, genetic progress um, and, and just can we continue to increase the production and the health traits without getting the cow bigger and bigger? Yes, I think it could be done. Um, well, I, it has been done in, in other uh, breeding philosophies. The other part of it, is its economics. A bigger cow takes more maintenance costs, more feed, more calories, just to maintain her mass. And so if she's given a significantly larger amount of fat and protein, then okay, that pencils out. But if you have a bunch of cows that are 300 pounds different in weight and are given the same amount of fat and protein a day, you're talking 40 to 50 cents per cow per day. And so you put that on 100 cows or 1,000 cows or 10,000 cows, then it's talk, you're talking dollars and cents. So part of it on the stature is, uh, can be attributed to just basic maintenance cost of that, of that animal. I think we saw that or see that adjustment and implementation in the new uh, feed efficiency, you know, model that they're they're rolling out and have rolled out. That that not only the uh, the maintenance and but also the salvage value of those animals as well comes uh, comes into factor as well. So I see a hand. I'm just gonna Randy. Some comments or any, um, John? Yeah, I, I mean, I've used I've used it in the past and and put some criteria in there. I don't use it on a on a regular basis, but I use the the logic behind it um, in create my own formulas. Yeah, absolutely. 
Journey, welcome. Uh, yeah, you know, I've used, uh, recently I've been using the Enlight program to run some of my uh, donors on and, and, and sort them that way. So, you know, say I've got several donors that I say, boy, these, I probably should flush these. And then I'll, I'll run them on the, uh, a custom index that's maybe basically straight up protein and, and DPR and somatic cell and then sort them that way too and see which ones I really like. I know there are, there's a lot of dairies using custom formulas, picking their own bulls. I think the, the Holstein breed is so diverse that I think John said it earlier, is you can find the kind of bull you want to use on your cows. And, and the Holstein Association has the tools available to find those bulls. And that, that's certainly a good point. When you're talking about the TPI formula though, then it, it, you've gotta be, are we in the right direction as a breed? To, to continue to be the, the, leading, the leading player. And so uh, overall, like I said, we've, we sure identified some really, really good bulls at the top of the TPI list. I think we just look for ways to, to reform some of the, some of the type uh, data and emphasis. Um, we've just started to use the Enlight program a few months ago, so I can't really comment on it, but uh, yes, we have used it. Don, did you have any comments uh, regarding that? You talked about your program just slightly and running through the inbreeding calculator, but. Okay, as far as formulas we're yes. using? Yes, yep. Um, yeah, we, we uh, have an in-house formula that's exclusively uh, protein and health traits. Uh, some folks, uh, were by uh, some uh, excellent geneticists and have critiqued it and we're probably going to make some adjustments in that. But one of the things uh, that we, uh, we watched a lot of fine breeders for years uh, use AAA and DMS uh, with the idea that uh, the purpose was to keep cattle from getting too refined or from getting too round and thick. One of the nice things about breeding for health traits and production at the same time, that's really what you're doing is you're pulling cattle to the middle because to have the health traits, you gotta have that strength and power, uh, but to have milk, you gotta um, have some, some refinement uh, uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, in breeding the two of them together, we're, we're real comfortable as taking us the direction we want to go. We, we don't use the uh, type numbers again because they're all too closely correlated with stature. Yeah, very good. Uh, Randy had that great question to bring those uh, good points forward. Is there any other questions uh, uh, from, the, from the floor at this time? I'll give you my quick, there's, like I said before, I, if I had the answers, I certainly would have already given them my opinion to Holstein. I, it's not an easy fix. There's a lot that goes into it. You have a lot of classifiers out there. A lot of them have been doing it a long time, and they, they do what they've been taught to do, and they're, they're good at it. Um, and so it's not, it's not an easy fix. It would take a, a real transformation in our classification system, and it would be quite the undertaking. Um, obviously, I would be in favor of trying something t to change it. Um, I know when I go, you know, when I'm looking at purchasing an animal and I, I see sh calves out of an 82-point dam, I go, all right, that's going to eliminate some people from bidding against me, and I know what an 82-point two-year-old looks like, <laughs> and I'm perfectly fine with it. Um, so, you know, to me, it's, if we're going to, if we're going to, lean so heavily on type in the formula, it's my opinion that, that we've got to make some changes because it goes back to the classification system. And obviously, I hope we conti people continue to classify because um, we need to verify genomic data. Um, I think there's a need for it. 
I would just like to see it a little bit different. Um, and, and the main thing is, we've already, we already talked about it, I don't need to hash on any longer, but it, it really goes back, stature just has so much to do with a final score on an animal. And, you know, as these classifiers, when they look at an animal, they have a score in their mind immediately after they look at her and, and they kind of work backwards and put the numbers in. And, and to me, that's not always the accurate data that we need, so. Greg, did you have any further comments or, Greg? Probably nine out of nine classifiers like show cows, and show cows got to be big, so. I think we've uh, spent too much time sitting behind a desk uh, deciding what a cow ought to look like. Uh, uh, what a cow's rump ought to look like is uh, how easy she calves, uh, how easy she breeds back, is there room enough uh, uh, for the rear udder and is she mobile? If she's got all four of those characteristics, she's got a great rump. Uh, George? So we're changing the topic a bit, as much as I'd like to talk about stature myself. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we've had a lot of discussion about genomics and there's uh, certainly Zoetis has been focusing on making the economic argument for whole herd genotyping. All of you have uh, large herds and then you certainly use uh, genomic evaluations to some extent. Are we really at the point where it's appropriate advice to encourage everyone to genotype every animal because of all the various uh, decisions they can make beyond just culling? And I, I ask the question because there are some excellent dairymen that don't genotype anything, and are they really sort of missing a bet here based on your experience? Certainly, I think there's a large percentage of genomic testing going on with this group, but. Uh, Don, are you on 100% or what's your percentage of your herd that you have genomic tested and uh, where's your? Uh, it, yeah, it, every female is tested at birth, uh, is sampled at birth and uh, the bull studs are doing maybe 12 to 1300 bulls a year. Okay, yep. Is that correct? Yes, you pretty much. We do not test all the females. Um, we do an awful lot of embryo transfer work every year, and we do test all of all of, both male and female uh, calves that are born, all the ET calves that are born. John or Greg, sorry. Well, yeah, I mean we're not we all of our Holsteins are getting genomic tested now, and really it's just been the last year that I've had had a significant amount to test. We maybe are getting 40 or 50. Uh, Holstein calves born a month right now, and we're testing all of those. Of course, the males, we're trying to identify which ones will go to, to stud, but you know, if they're not below a five and a half calving ease, Alta won't look at them, so we, no, I'm, I'm just kidding, Alt John, I was just. <laughs> anyway, um, there's, uh, we, uh, as far as the general commercial guys, you know, I think, I think it's gaining traction, especially, with the improvements in the sex semen product, I'm certain more guys are going to breed their top end heifers to get heifers and continue to breed the bottom end to beef semen. And at some point, you know, the bull calves are gonna be worth $25 again, and then everybody's gonna say, oh, let's go back the other way. You know, that's how the industry goes. <laughs> Whatever everybody's doing, then it, uh, it changes a little bit. As an industry, there's always those that maybe are a little more forward thinking. But I, there's a large herd, you know, milking 8,000 cows that I know pretty well, and they're, they're starting to genomic test everything. They're even gonna do some IVF on their own females that are better. They're using their lower end as recips, and I think there are some, uh, some good, it's a good investment when used right, and I think it's, it's gaining some traction in the in a lot of the commercial herds. I'm I'm seeing it locally where I'm at. Certainly, and I mean I would assume somebody's already developing some of these things, or maybe it's developed, you know, to where you would mate these females to the males based just off of their genomic profiles and inbreeding being part of it, but also you could set it up to 
you know, this heifer's low on protein, let's put a high protein bull on her or something. I mean, the matings are gonna go that way more than going out there with the, uh, you know, the linear changes, SMS or whatever. And so I, it's, it's gaining traction, uh, and I think there's some good economic reasons to do it. I think, just real quick, if I can just answer, that's a good question. Um, we started, several years ago, I started base guiding every female uh, that was born on the dairy, and then I would use parent averages, and, and we were testing the top 20%. Um, and so we were doing about 100 genomic tests on, on Holste or, yeah, Holsteins per month. And then our goal was just to identify the, the extreme high ones, you know, that top half a percent that we could, could work with. Um, re, in the last three or four months, I've actually started testing all of our females. Um, I'm going to do a run, I'm going to compile some information and make some decisions internally whether we continue to do that. It, would I suggest that to everybody? No. I'm not sure that I'm going to continue to do it long term, but. Um, first, I've got to decide what am I going to use with that information, especially on the, the bottom end, females. Am I, am I going to start selling a lot more females? Um, obviously, we put a lot of embryos in, and so we use that information to determine, you know, which top 20 percent, they're not getting an embryo no matter what. The bottom 20 percent, they're getting an embryo no matter what. In the middle, if they happen to be heat, in heat on a day that we're saving recipients, they're getting a, an embryo. Um, but we've got to make that decision whether we get, whether we continue to do that or not, because it's obviously a, a fairly large investment. Uh, if it didn't cost anything, I'd definitely do it, because it's, it's great information to have, and I love looking at spreadsheets and sorting and, and using Excel and that type of thing. Um, but I think we were probably identifying most of the high ones uh, without testing the whole herd. Uh, so I've just got to figure out what we're going to do with that, with that other information. There's, you know, I've had a lot of commercial dairymen ask me what they should do, and most of the time, you don't need to IVF and genomic test everything to make good genomic or genetic progress. I mean, use good bulls, and just keep using good bulls, and you'll make great gene genetic progress, and it's a heck of a lot easier than doing IVF and flush work and that type of thing. We obviously do it because we're trying to create some extreme high uh, females and males, um, but you know, and there's been some commercial dairies that come to you and said, hey, we just tested a bunch of heifers and I've got, I've got this heifer that's 500 net merit and I'm thinking about doing some IVF work. And, you know, I've said, what you really ought to do is use some really good bulls for a while. If you want to do some IVF work, go purchase a, a real, you know, a higher animal. She doesn't have to be the highest one, but go purchase one and then do your IVF work. But um, I think it's, it's, I think it depends on the, what you're going to use information for. There's definitely, definitely use for it. And right now I'm testing every female, both Jersey and Holstein. I think it, uh, sorry, Bob, did you have a question there? Go ahead. Just gonna, can I hold that question, Tom? Is that something you can address tomorrow a little bit or? Okay, okay. Um, I, just with, with changing gears maybe a little bit, I think uh, I'm just going to hold that question, if you will, Bob, before I'm going to maybe excuse our, our panel here as we're coming down. I don't, uh, um, there's going to be a few of these gentlemen that will be here this evening, and uh, John is slipping out, so I think it is a, a couple hours before these guys maybe need to run, but uh, um, certainly it's, uh, their knowledge has been tremendous and how much we can get from them. We certainly appreciate their time and they have lots of commitments when you, when you uh, look at how much they've got going on and they still can want to share their values and their opinions. Um, and as you can see, they, they, are, they have some strong opinions and, and uh, it can certainly give us some strong change as well. So I think it'd be a great time to show your appreciation for these four gentlemen and how, uh, how they've driven us forward. So.